I'm Dorothy Biberman, Director of Global Engagement and Executive Initiatives at the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. And welcome and thank you for joining the 2020 ASPPH Virtual Annual Meeting Session, Legal Determinants of Health, Implications for Public Health and Global Health Education. We hope you can all join us for the complete ASPPH Virtual Annual Meeting Program every Friday until May 15th. All sessions are being recorded and links will be available on our webpage. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session, Dr. Keith Martin, Executive Director of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. Dr. Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Dorothy. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to be here to moderate this important session. Much thanks to ASPPH for pivoting uh, to be able to run these sessions and share what was going to be in your annual meeting. Uh, this session is on the legal determinants of health, implications for public health and global health. We know that addressing global health challenges to improve the, the health of people and the planet rests on state stability, the ability of nations to deliver public goods. And this requires significant and important structures, public structures, effective public institutions that can deliver the goods that the public wants. This foundation is also vital to the capacity of nations to engage in multilateral efforts to address global health challenges that know no boundaries. And we're seeing one right now, of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic. But it also is vital to address other transboundary issues, whether it's climate change or pollution, ocean health or biodiversity losses. These global challenges that know no boundaries and of course require an effort that also know no boundaries. So crucial to this mention, this foundation of state stability is the capacity of nations to deliver global health with justice. And that is the law, the ability to have judicial capacity, legal instruments, and to be able to apply them within a foundation of global, recognized global health law um, uh, norms. It's also vital to be able to address and achieve the 17 sustainable development goals. And the strength of these legal systems are obviously crucial to being able for any country to be able to address the social determinants of health that every country faces. Unfortunately, law has been underutilized in global health. And there's a gap between the biomedical community that has dominated global health and the legal community. That's a gap that needs to be overcome. So in response to this, it's uh, the Lancet O'Neill Commission on Global Health and Law was created and in 2019 published a report outlining how laws can be used to advance global health. And they made recommendations to advance global health with justice, which is crucially important as we move forward in the 21st century. This session will present the findings and recommendations of the commission and discuss how they can be incorporated into public health and global health and education. And we have three fabulous panelists who are going to do that for us today. The first speaker in the order in which they will come is Dr. John Monaghan. Dr. Monaghan is a senior scholar at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University. He was also one of the lead authors of the report that you'll hear about. Montrese Ransom is a lawyer. She's also a senior public health analyst, team lead for public health law training and workforce development at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in the United States. And Dr. Sabina Rashid is the Dean of the Brack James P. Grant School of Public Health at Brack University in Bangladesh. And she was also a contributor to this effort. I wanna just say to everybody online right now that you can ask questions in writing at any time during the session by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll hold all the questions at the end and we'll, ask, we'll get to as many questions as possible as time allows. So it's really my, my pleasure to invite Dr. Monaghan to begin his presentation. Dr. Monaghan, over to you and thank you for joining us. Oh, great. Keith, uh... Keith, thank you very much. Um, I should clarify that I, uh, to all the doctors uh, and physicians on this call that I'm, I'm a, a JD, I'm a lawyer, um, but uh, so, so you can, uh, so, so, but I, I always appreciate the honor, Keith. And, um, and I also wanna thank you for the, the introduction and thank you in particular for the 
tremendous work you've done with the Consortium of Universities and Global Health to really turn it into the force that it is today. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, ASPPH for doing this really innovative approach to putting online uh, what would have been a terrific in-person conference. So, so kudos to, to uh, the entire team at ASPPH. So, so I, I, what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to give you an overview of the commission, its report, its recommendations, and the steps that were taken to move forward. So probably the best place to start is with the charge of the commission, which was fairly straightforward, which was how to harness the power of law to improve health outcomes for people everywhere. I included in this slide a link to the commission report if you're uh, interested in reading the full report. Um, as to where it came from, the commission really uh, was a culmination of almost four years of work by a, a truly distinguished group of experts, a group divided almost evenly between the global north and the global south with a roughly equal composition of lawyers and health professionals. Uh, we were really fortunate that we had two former WHO regional directors, Mirta Rosas and Ala Alwan, a former Minister of Health uh, from Africa, a former Assistant Secretary of Health of the United States, a former Global AIDS Coordinator, and the VP for Health at the World Bank, along with a distinguished group of lawyers. Um, and so, what did we do? Well, as you can imagine, and, and I unfortunately, since we're not in real time, I can't tell if people will laugh at this, but I'll just say it anyway. I say it every time I describe it. We first, the commission first met, I was not so sure that a group of highly opinionated, very experienced doctors and lawyers in a room would immediately come to a consensus. But actually, I, I, you know, it would be more like thinking of dogs and cats playing together or Democrats and Republicans, whatever your metaphor is. Um, but you know, what was really fascinating was how quickly in the committee's deliberations people came together. Uh, and frankly, at the insistence of, our, of the health colleagues, we quickly, we quickly coalesced around these two core messages. Well, first, we coalesced around the idea that the audience for the commission's report really needs to be the health and science communities. Our health and science experts felt, as, as, a, as Dr. Martin said at the beginning, that, that law is an underappreciated tool. And so we came together early on around two core messages, that law, law is a, a powerful determinant of health and for health outcomes everywhere, and that law is an under, underutilized tool for improving health around the world. So that was an early call about audience and messages. And so we started the report with what we call a basic primer on the law, with an idea of the audience that might not know what the law, what and how the law operates. So the first point was that the, the commission argues in its report that law is everywhere and it impacts almost everything. Or put another way, law is how we actually do justice or not to one another in all countries and between countries. Law does many practical things. It defines the rights and duties of individuals, shapes markets, organizes governments, resolves disputes, and establishes and regulates public agencies, private companies, and nonprofit institutions. And law further operates at the global, national, regional, and local levels in the context of many different kinds of societies and cultures. And this leads to a complex interplay of authorities and responsibilities among multiple jurisdictions, officials, and laws. In many ways, you can think of the law as the working language, if you will, the lingua franca of public policymakers, and that was the frame that we offered. The commission then turned to enumerate what we, what, what, what we described as sort of three core functions of law. One is establishing standards of individual conduct, and we described that in some detail. So for example, can you drive a car without wearing a safety belt? How do you, can you sell a product that's not registered? A second function we dove into is resolving disputes. And so sort of classically people think of courtrooms, but there are, as you know, many ways, alternative and administrative dispute resolution, resolution systems that we covered. And particularly in the context of health, we had a discussion about the role of strategic litigation to drive policy change. A classic example there being tobacco control. And a third function, and, and, and Dr. Martin referenced this at the outset, is. We, we talked about the fundamental role of law in governing public and private institutions. 
roles and responsibility, powers and authorities. A classic example here in the United States in the last several weeks has been, I think for many Americans, a, a lesson in federalism. The, the, as, we think, as we see how the different levels of government are responding to the COVID-19 outbreak and the functions and roles and duties, and even authorities, we saw most recently a debate between the president and governors about who had the lead on reopening um, um, economy. So anyway, just an example of the critical role of law. And then we turn to uh, a, 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 an issue that I think is, 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 is unique to international law and but very important to global health law. And this is the distinction between what we call hard law, namely treaties such as the international health regulations that are binding under international law versus so-called soft rules, the multiple, for example, the multiple strategies, plans, and similar documents affirmed by the World Health Assembly and other bodies that have normative, if not formal, legal effect. And those, that's a critical distinction we'll get to later. And then finally, um, uh, the, while distinct from law and legal institutions per se, the commission also devoted quite a bit of time to the vital concept of the rule of law. This is the notion that no person is above the law and that we all should stand equally before the law. This principle embodied in many fundamental international agreements and national constitutions speaks to what we should expect of any health system that advances equity, values human rights, and pr promotes justice. So with that primer, um, and this is just a, a visual um, that gives you a little bit of a, a sense of what I discussed. You can see we, the, the visual here shows the different levels of law, international, national, sort of the, the core components, subnational laws that are domestic. You've got, and also you have the distinction between binding law and soft rules. And as you can sense by this picture, there is a, a, an idea of a flow that, that soft rules can often influence binding international law, international law can affect domestic law, which in turn is a cycle to international law. So we see this as a living ecosystem, not as uh, just rules on paper, but, but, but that was uh, what the commission wanted to convey, especially to our health colleagues who might not have focused on the legal system and its complex interplay. So what's the sort of the, the, the the, the key ambition, I would say, to the commission's uh, uh, report was to situate the law firmly within the concept of the social determinants of health, which hold that economic and social factors are generally more powerful predictors of health outcomes for people than the provision of health care alone. And specifically, the commission argues that the global health community should pay more attention to this term we phrase, the legal determinants of health namely the both the good and the bad ways in which the legal system can advance or in far too many cases undermine health outcomes. So without going into a lot of detail, we sort of talk on one side of the ledger, the report speaks to how we can see and appreciate the unquestionably positive benefits of effective public health regulations, immunization requirements, environmental standards, drug and food safety programs, occupational health rules, road safety measures, taxes on tobacco products, uh, universal health coverage laws, all these legal interventions in, come together to make our lives, our families, our homes, and our communities safer, healthier, and more productive. And while, mo while most of these good laws are implemented at the national, good laws, so to speak, are at the national and local level, the commission also took time to note that international action is critical here, and sort of an example being the role of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control being both a commitment of global normative standard, but also a way to support uh, domestic uh, tobacco reform. But the report, just to be clear, is also clear as is also enumerates the many many ways in which law is undermines health, and in particular, we we under we clarified that the law in many cases um, has uh, has has undermined the health of women, minorities, indigenous peoples, LGBTQ populations, and many other less powerful groups in society. We, we talked about how public health is compromised when private industries produce dangerous products such as tobacco and firearms that aren't effectively regulated. And we, we noted that uh, with regret how little progress has been made in combating the global epidemic of obesity without that, and we won't, we don't think that there'll be much progress without better regulation of the food and drug industry. 
And finally, especially because we're in a global debate now about antivirals and vaccines, we also talked about how access to medicines cannot, should, should not be restricted by a, a global intellectual property regime um, as we have and that we need to find a better way to balance affordability and innovation. And so we, we also, and then because of obviously the moment we're in, we talked about a number of, of gaps in international law, but I would just suffice to say that I think the last several months clearly shows that our, our, the international health regulations, the institutions we have are maybe necessary, but far from sufficient to address a global pandemic. And happy to talk about that more when we get into the, the discussion section. So we, we then turn to identifying four primary legal determinants of health that we hope the, the global community would focus on. And the first is to think of, the first is, is, how, is to think of a legal determinant of health is first how law translates vision into action. And the clearest example we use here is the way that law creates universal health coverage or in cases like the United States does not, but how the legal, how laws shape how our health coverage system works. A second legal determinant focuses on how law strengthens or not the governance of critical public institutions impacting health. And again, an example here would be the, the role of the WHO and the IHRs during the current pandemic. A third legal determinant is where we say that where we focus on how the law serves as a means for fair evidence-based health interventions. A classic example here would be the effective regulation of food and drugs. And then finally, and maybe especially for this audience of public health schools, we, we spoke quite a bit about the need to build greater capacity, bridging across uh, disciplines, build legal capacity for health. We think there's an enormous agenda here, both in law training and in health training, about a better understanding of how we go forward. So we, we, we then uh, finished the report with seven specific recommendations. And so let me walk through those fairly quickly. Um, and as uh, just to emphasize a point Dr. Martin made again, the commission closes and, and we frame seven recommendations for advancing what we call health with justice. So first, we call on, first is that the international community should support and evaluate the compliance of countries in developing and implementing universal health coverage laws and regulations. Second, that all countries should pursue a rights-based legal framework for universal health coverage that promotes principles of equity and non-discrimination while ensuring access and affordability and leaving nobody behind. Number three, that, the, that health related international organizations should use their legal authorities to formally adopt good governance standards that promote transparency, accountability, and participation. And number four, that national governments should, should, should develop country level mechanisms such as health impact assessments for all pending legislation in pursuing evidence-based legal interventions for health. Number five, that the WHO should increase its legal capacity to build, uh, build a global evidence base for health laws and to work with countries to adopt such laws. Number six, that national governments should similarly convene multi-sector teams of health and legal experts to develop and implement evidence-based legal interventions to improve health. And seventh, the w, the, we, we, ask, we call on WHO to partner with the Lancet and other organizations to establish a standing independent commission on global health and law that could serve as a global public good in this space. Since the commission's report came out last May, we've been delighted we had a, a launch event in Washington in May. We had a, uh, an event, uh, I'll tell you about more, which is a, our, our legal solutions network that we launched on the margins of the UN General Assembly in September in New York. We had a special session with the Chief Justice of the UK Supreme Court in London in October. And then we just, uh, in February, before everybody stopped traveling, we had a terrific day in, with several of our commissioners in Geneva at UNAIDS, where we discussed uh, the commission heads report. So, um, so let me close by saying that we have, um, so three, there are three steps that we're, we're moving on. One is 
Um, as I mentioned, the Standing Commission on Global Health and Law, we've had preliminary meetings with the WHO, who've expressed an interest in hosting this, so uh, we're optimistic going forward. The second step is the UHC Legal Solutions Network, and I know I'm running short on my time here, but just to, to um, give you, a, this is a, a partnership between WHO, UNAIDS, UNDP, the Interparliamentary Union in Georgetown. Our goal is to collaborate across these organizations to provide drafting toolkits for countries that want to work on health law issues, particularly UHC. And then finally, last but not least, and I suspect a number of my colleagues are going to talk about this on the, on the panel, is um, we are continuing to do work on health law issues. Uh, obviously, there are a number of international issues I referenced regarding COVID. Uh, but also domestically, I would note, and I think this is really important, when we think of the legal determinants of health, it is not just the laws that say health. It is the economic and social supports that I think are both critical for public health responses and for social justice. And I provide you a link here about a, a recent blog post we put on uh, about how to think about these issues in the, in the U.S. context, but obviously it's relevant in many other places. So let me stop there. I apologize if I went over to my colleagues uh, and really look forward to the rest of the panel discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Monaghan, for succinctly describing the, giving us a great overview of the report, the legal determinants, the recommendations, and the really crucial next steps that you described. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, hand it off to Montrese Ransom. Uh, Montrese, over to you. Perfect. I'm excited to be here um, to offer some a few perspectives from CDC's public health law program in response to um, the Lancet report and John's presentation. Um, I'd like to start out by saying absolutely law is definitely a critical determinant of health um, and it, I'd argue one of the most significant determinants of health because it undergirds um, all of our traditional determinants of health. Um, and as a field, um, as the field of public health, we rely on partners, health educators, advocates, lawyers, public health practitioners, um, to develop, implement, enforce, and educate the public about laws um, and how to comply. It's a part of our essential public health services that we deliver in the United States. Um, and as I'll talk about a little bit today in, in sort of response to John's remarks. Um, we also all have a, a role to play in studying the impact of those laws. So I need to offer a quick disclaimer. Um, it just basically says I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. <laughs> if you need legal advice on anything that I discussed today, please uh, find someone who is licensed in your jurisdiction. Um, it's also important to note that though these materials have been cleared by CDC, they do not represent any agency determination or policy. So um, in CDC's public health law program, I've been there for about 17 of my 19 years um, in the field of public health. And over the years, our um, mission has really stayed the same. Although we've expanded the topics that we work on, we've, we've broadened um, the, the areas in which we connect law and public health. Our beginnings were focused on legal preparedness for public health emergencies, but we cover just about everything now. Um, and although we've expanded the things that we work on, our mission has stayed the same, to advance the use and the understanding of law as a public health tool. Um, and we do it by working in three primary buckets, um, the legal epidemiology bucket, which is our training and, uh, excuse me, our research and translation team that's run by a woman called, a uh, woman named Tara Ramanathan Holiday, our partnership and outreach team, um, which is led by a woman named Abigail Farrell, um, and then my team, which is the training and workforce development team, the last 10 years, the primary focus of my work has really been on um, helping to increase the competency of practitioners in the field to better use and understand law as a public health tool, as a tool just like any other tool in the public health toolbox. So the way we think about public health law and the public health law program, um, sort of through the years, we've seen two distinct domains emerge. I wanna encourage each of you who are on the line to check out CDC's public health law competency model. It delineates um, the minimum uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities needed by public health practitioners not trained in law to effectively do 
everyday public health practice. Um, and in creating that model, we found that there were two distinct domains that emerged, um, foundational public health law and interventional public health law. And we like to think about it like a ship. So when you think about a ship, a ship has um, a hull, a foundation, um, and without it, we have no footing, no structure, and no base. And then, um, as we see in the picture here, um, we've got the sails. And, and apparently, as I'm doing this analogy more and more, people are giving me uh, in information about ships, but apparently it's the sails and the rudder that help make sure the ship is guided in the right direction. Similarly, um, foundational public health law, which really consists of constitutional frameworks and the legal authorities for everyday public health practice in this country, um, they form the foundation, um, the base of the system in which we operate. Um, just like the sails and the rudder direct the ship and make sure it's going in the right direction, um, law can be used to change the context in which we live, learn, work, play, and worship. Um, and just like a ship needs a captain and a deck crew and maintenance workers and first mates and a cruise director and a DJ, because the only ships that I'm really familiar with are cruise ships, just to be honest, but you see where I'm going here. Um, a ship needs a variety of players to move it forward, um, as does public health and public health law. Um, my point there is that public health law cannot be and is not strictly the domain of lawyers. It is by its nature transdisciplinary. I like to say that public health law, when it's done right, couples scientific insight with legal might. There are a whole bunch of, of really savvy public health practitioners out there in the field um, really getting the work done and finding ways to um, effectively use law to advance their goals and advance their work and improve health outcomes. And I'm sure there are many of you on this Zoom call now. Um, that's what this transdisciplinary model contemplates. It contemplates um, this idea of providing opportunities to really embed scientific advances into our legal systems and structures. The transdisciplinary model also contemplates um, policy surveillance. Um, in public health, empirical, scientific, public health law research on the impact of these laws. Do they work? Are, we, are they doing what we anticipated um, them to do? Um, and also the impact of these laws on our system as a whole and on um, public health operations. And to be clear, this type of collaboration is not new, right? Um, if we think about the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century, advances that we've seen in uh, vaccinations, healthier mothers and babies, reduction in, heart, reduction in heart disease and stroke, safer drinking water, just to name a few, they all can be attributed to linking scientific insight with legal might. Um, and if we want to see the same sort of advances that we saw in the 20th century, in the 21st century, if we want to see those same sort of sustainable advances, um, it's important that all hands are on deck to use the ship analogy again. This means developing a public health workforce that is competent in the use and understanding of law as a public health tool. So typically in this space, I would ask you to um, use the chat box or um, by show of hands, tell me how many of you all have heard of Legal Epi. If you know how to use um, the reactions, if you have access to those, you can give me a thumbs up. Um, but by definition, Legal Epi is the scientific study of law as a factor and the cause, distribution, and prevention of disease and injury in a population. Legal practice, those of us who are lawyers um, that represent a health agency or work in the field in that capacity, we apply the law. Um, legal epidemiology, on the other hand, measures the law. The idea here is to study the impact of the law on health outcomes. So legal epi studies can provide answers to um, questions that can be really critical for policy analysis, really critical when you're determining how you might want to use laws to uh, improve health outcomes in your communities. Um, so the question becomes questions like, what do laws say across jurisdictions on a topic? How do laws vary? How do they change over time? What laws actually have staying power? Um, do we see trends in law that relate to trends in health? Can we make connections between the language and the law on the books and health outcomes. And as we consider um, things like fiscal and economic impact, it's also smart to look at, at what impact law has on health um, and the costs and, and our health systems overall. This information, this legal data 
coupled with public health surveillance data um, can, can better help us properly analyze policy options. So um, I hope that, that um, you guys have seen this map from um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. If not, I encourage you to, to go check them out, um, indicating um, life expectancy by zip code, in this instance, by exit along a map. Um, and the interesting thing about this particular map is you can see a 12-year life expectancy drop. Um, in the, in the upper left-hand corner, 87 years old at exit 189 versus 75 at exit 132 um, in two neighboring counties. Um, and if you're like those of us in the public health law program, one of our immediate questions um, was why is that? Um, this is the perfect sort of question for legal epidemiology to help answer. So legal epi um, really can help investigate how differences in the existence of laws or the enforcement of certain laws impact health. So in this example, Merced County may have a law on the books that um, regulates smoking or road safety or clean water, or maybe Merced and Fresno have the exact same laws on the books, but there's some differences in how those laws are enforced. Legal epi must also take into account socioeconomic variables um, and um, things that things like, you know, where those specific jurisdictions are located or in a des desert area or in the mountains. Um, and the economy within those jurisdictions? Do they have higher rates of poverty or educational disparities? Those are things that we have to look at, but the goal of legal epi studies is to study law as a factor that affects health. Because John, as John and um, the Lancet Report really have described, and as you'll hear from Sabina, um, and as what I've hoped I've convinced you of in my short time with you today, is law is a crucial and foundational determinant of health. Um, I want to say um, before I close out that by not prioritizing um, law in schools and programs of public health, by not ensuring that the next generation of public health practitioners and leaders are really competent um, in both foundational and interventional public health law, we're missing opportunities, critical opportunities to effectively use law um, to, address how, how, to address health outcomes and emerging health threats um, and to really pursue health equity as we move into the future. I think, um, as John mentioned, our goal really needs to be looking at um, how some of the laws that undergird our housing system, our transportation system, our educational system, all of those things, how laws that, that create those frameworks impact health outcomes. Um, and it's important for our public health practitioners to be at that table. Um, so in closing, I just wanna say that it's our position in the public health law program that law is a crucial and foundational determinant of health. The Lancet piece and, and the work that's being done is in, in a critical and important to addition to the literature and to the work that's happening in the field domestically in public health law, because it really supports and advances this idea that laws and regulations and policies and the structural frameworks they create have powerful effects on population level health. And we included some excerpts here on the slide from the Lancet report that really touched to that point. One obvious example that, that I really like to point to is um, you know, the separate but equal doctrine that was established in the United States that allowed racial segregation in housing, healthcare, education, employment, transportation. And we see um, the consequences of these seemingly insurmountable health disparities as we try to address um, current crises today. Um, at the same time, while Law is a determinant of health, and I, again, argue one of the most significant determinants of health. It's also a tool that public health practitioners, whether lawyers or non-lawyers, um, really need to build their capacity in using to better improve health outcomes. Um, and so I'll go ahead and uh, share my contact information here on this slide and some information on the public health law program. Again, my email address. And for those folks who want to learn more about um, public health law, public health law 101, um, or legal epidemiology, we have free online on demand trainings um, on the Public Health Law Academy, which you can find at that website listed there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ransom. Uh, that was really. Blended. And thank you for sharing all the really outstanding work you and your colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control, the finance 
public health institution in the world. You serve the people here in the United States and around the world. Your bottom line is to save lives and reduce suffering and you do it uh, quietly uh, with grace and with great diligence and everybody should be eternally grateful for you and other public servants around the U.S. who do that on a daily basis. So thank you for doing it. And thank you for bringing up also the dramatic differences in uh, life expectancy, maternal mortality, infant mortality amongst low-income African-American and First Nations communities here. It is a story that we hope can be brought to the forefront and addressed uh, with vigor. Uh, so it's my really great honor to introduce uh, uh, Dean Sabina Rashid and turn it over to you, Dean Rashid. Thank you for, for being here all the way from Bangladesh. Over to you. Uh, it's morning there and it's almost uh, night here. Well, it's actually 11.35, so it's nice to be here. I wanted to take it from a different angle. I'm a critical medical anthropologist and I've been working in uh, Bangladesh since my 20s. And I'd really like the entire understanding of public health to be reframed around the lens of social justice and human rights. Uh, the challenge with uh, public health increasingly, or I mean, you have much more multidisciplinary uh, groups coming together to work together, is that when we look at pandemics like COVID-19 or many other sort of epidemics, uh, the, the risk is seen as an individual determinant of health, which means that the individual is decontextualized and removed from the very context that they live. And if I see the way the pandemic is unfolding globally, where a lot more minorities and poorer people are being affected, in Bangladesh, a large percentage of the population are working in the informal sector, which means they rely on daily labor and daily wages to manage. So here is the dilemma uh, with, uh, there's a fear of hunger and hunger versus health risks because there's a real fear of community transmission. And I think it is a dilemma and it's a moral ethical dilemma. If you're trying to look at public health, I'd like us to expand or rethink this notion of public health from a human rights framework, a social justice framework, which means looking at risks from the very structural social inequalities of the individuals that live in particular environments. Um, we're doing a lot of survey and research at the moment, rapid assessments looking at how people's lives are completely unfolding and, and um, breaking down uh, because there's no jobs, there's no food, they're worried about many, many consequences. Although the government has rolled out a stimulus package to provide food and relief distribution, that takes time and, 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 there, and it is also, there are challenges with management. So one key point is I really think most schools of public health in terms of education need to really reframe public health beyond just biomedical and a disease oriented focus, uh, which allows other disciplines, but also law, history, political scientists, um, uh, critical medical anthropologists to contribute to the curriculum and education of students who then go on to work and serve in various organizations and recommendations and policies uh, can be very top down. That's my first point. My second point is that we really need to understand how uh, something like the COVID pandemic has it, it instilled a lot of fear and stigma amongst communities. And this is because of um, the shutdown, but also global media, local media, and people just don't know what they're grappling with. Now, this sort of fear is across all social classes, but for the poorest, uh, from a, a human rights perspective, they have the least amount of social safety nets, so they have the most to lose. So um, one thing we've done at our BRAC School of Public Health that was set up in 2004, is that in 2000, 17, we we've always had anthropology and public health, and I, we do a lot of training and capacity building with lawyers, but we introduced in our curriculum a community-centered perspective to understand uh, communities' health perspectives, needs, and priorities, 
how do communities articulate their rights versus how we articulate rights on behalf of communities. And also in terms of designing programs, students have to go back to communities after talking to program people to see if there's a mismatch or if there's synergy between the communities that they speak to and the programs. And I think that's extremely important to allow for that critical perspective, but um, a very grounded perspective, because what is public health? What is law? A lot of the disciplines we're involved in is to actually improve the lives of the most disadvantaged, or people actually have access to certain rights. And what happens is if you have weak governance or you don't have strong uh, enforcement of law or you have enforcement of law, which is where they're shut down for whatever reason, it's a difficult decision. People are grappling with fighting the, the transmission, but also you have state being used in the law being used in many different ways. So it's very important from 2017 that we wanted our students to bring in this perspective and have an understanding of public health beyond just biomedicine and disease and epidemiology and biostatistics, which is critical to learning, but also that sort of community-centered perspective that allows them to really understand, listen and learn from the very communities we seek to serve. So I think it's very important because as I spend time and I've been living in Bangladesh since 93, I'm Bangladeshi, but I've been living and working here since then, that the notion of social justice needs to inform our thinking, our research, our teaching, and even with the policies that, uh, that, um, uh, that are enacted globally and locally. I mean, we have policies that are, that are extremely you know, powerful and very useful, but how do we ensure implementation of these uh, uh, to, to ensure that the most disadvantaged who have the least amount of voice can actually get uh, ahead. And uh, something like the COVID pandemic reminds me of how for them, you know, for many of the poor, um, everyday life is a challenge and they're juggling economic, social health um, every day. And lives are so precarious that the way we embody risk as middle-class or well-to-do uh, individuals and professionals and the way the most marginalized communities uh, embody and live risk is very different. And this is where it is so important to uh, always have that social justice perspective because as health is a right, food is a right. Um, and, and, and here's the, the dilemma which we're facing and I'm sure the low-income countries will be facing and maybe in other countries if the lockdown continues is the economic collapse. So there's the economic mortalities and then there's also the uh, the, the, from hunger and, and from lack of jobs to the health risks. And I leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Rashid, for those, uh, those outstanding comments. Um, we're going to go to questions and answers right now with the audience. And I would just encourage all of the participants who are online to please submit your questions into the Q&A box and uh, we'll pose them to, to the speakers and get through as many of them as possible before the, the top of the hour. Um, so while your questions are coming in, I'd like to ask uh, Dean Rashid, um, you're in Bangladesh, a lack of capacity in, in legal structures is a real challenge in low, uh, in middle, low and low middle income countries. Can you suggest how um, we can, how the, uh, these legal structures can be most effectively strengthened in fragile settings? You know, I mean, I think we, we do have lawyers and we do have an active civil society. Uh, the NGO movement, civil society actors, lawyers are quite active. Um, in terms of, I think, you know, everything is interlinked. So if you're looking at um, law, you have to look at governance, you have to look at um, the level of uh, freedom. You have to look at the level of access to information. You have to look at uh, abilities to, to be able to be well resourced to work together. So while we have some very good lawyers, you know, I saw Sarah Hussain's name. I work very closely with her on capacity building and training legal practitioners on the ground on LGBT to, to adolescents, to divorce and child marriage and how to help young women in, in, in the villages. We've been running this for three years. Uh, the reality is that 
uh, laws being implemented is directly linked to the systems in place that allow one to implement laws, right? And, um, uh, and, and I, I often find that when there's a huge movement of actors coming together and there's a mobilization, and when there's pushback, um, usually, you know, authorities in power will tend to listen, but it just depends on the, the situation and the environment. I don't know if that kind of answers your question. But yes, it, it did. Th thanks very, very much. And, and um, uh, the next question I'm, I'm going to ask Professor Monaghan, and um, we know that, that um, uh, the, the gap exists between, or the real challenge between, we have uh, laws on the books internationally, we have um, responsibilities to protect, for example, but no obligations to act. Can you share with us your thoughts in terms of how compliance, how we can improve compliance and enforcement of international legal obligations and instruments? It's an excellent question, uh, uh, Keith. It was, um, I, I think, you know, I think, I think everyone who's studied international law or in my case, you teach it, um, the question of compliance is, comes to mind immediately. We have a, you know, the, the history of international law is, is basically the, the, the rules in which nation states will agree, uh, agree, will agree in writing to be bound by, but even when countries agree in writing to be bound, they're not necessarily compliant. Um, this is, a, I, I, I think you can, I, I think there are ways to improve within that broad framework, there's ways to improve, but before I jump to those, I do want to say that I, I do think that COVID-19, um, climate change. I mean, we're, we're in an era where there are issues that demand um, the international community to operate differently. And uh, if we're gonna succeed, now maybe we won't succeed, but it, but it will, um, uh, it, does, it does, when we have a common global threat that requires uh, cooperation, not just in intent, but cooperation in action, you, it is a real challenge when the legal instruments have no um, meaningful sanctions or uh, uh, to, 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 for enforcement. But I, having said that, without being totally negative, I, I do think that there are ways forward, and I think we've seen some real um, uh, innovations even in this space. For example, I, I think one of the most interesting parts of uh, the global health security agenda. Now that is an entity that was a process that wasn't necessarily under the UN rubric, but it is an agreement with probably 60, 70 countries now. An element of that, um, that that's a, a group of nations that came together to think about how to support countries in improving their ability to prepare and respond to, to uh, pandemic threats. One of the steps in that process has been a, a joint evaluation um, initiative where countries agree to allow independent about external evaluations of their work so as to identify gaps that can be helped be closed. I think you could see in the uh, uh, international, the, 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 the polio um, campaign, uh, the polio monitoring board is again another entity where maybe it isn't a sanction in the pure sense of, of international law, but information is gathered and shared and, and, and through data through careful monitoring, you can try to improve country performance. But I think uh, just to summarize, I think uh, you're right that that's a weakness of international law. And what we have to do is try to find ways to create the right incentives for con positive country action. Thanks very much, uh, um, very, very much. Uh, can I add something to this? Sorry, please. just, uh, just, just please. take me a minute. Please. You know, I mean, the, the challenge here is you've got the intersection of global politics. You've got, you know, uh, countries uh, have, um, international countries have agendas. Uh, so, do our, so does each country. You've got the intersection of multinational corporations. So that complicates that whole kind of, you know, the, the implementation of really good laws. Uh, because you've got all these other actors who are powerful and have different kinds of agendas that complicate and 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 make the scene messy. Sorry, I just wanted to add that. Yeah. No, by all means, and if I can ask, just to follow up to both of you on this, and Montrees, by all means, to please jump jump in. Um, the issue of of um, 
of uh, state sovereignty and the rights of states to do whatever they want versus their obligation under international norms that they've signed on to, that tension exists. And, and it's been trampled, we know, in countries around the world that uh, despotic leaders are hiding behind the notion that state sovereignty trumps international obligations. Do you, either of you have a, a sense, uh, John and Sabina, of, of where the next steps are to get over that, that tension? It's a, I think it's a false one. Well, I can, Sabina, would you want to go first? Or I, I'm happy to. Okay. okay. Well, I, 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 I won't have a satisfactory answer for you, Keith, I, other than I, uh, I, I, I do think that sometimes events like the one that we're going through now um, show the risks of, of an international system where every country, obviously every country is always gonna have, as Sabina noted, their own interests, they're gonna pursue their own diplomacy. But sometimes the costs of that um, system of individual actors without, um, without uh, compliance with the international norms uh, is not obvious. You know, the day-to-day -day costs of failing to have a cooperative system aren't clear. I think this moment right now, I think for the global community, we, we, we can see the cost of not sharing information as effectively as we could. We see the costs of not having a global preparedness uh, regime where, where we seriously look at our, our supply needs and understanding that a global pandemic will put an enormous pressure on global supply chains simultaneously everywhere. Um, and we need to think of a better way to do that. We are, we are just about starting the conversation about what if we do have a vaccine? What if we do have antivi antivirals of some kind that are effective at least in reducing the progress of this disease? How are, we gonna, how are we gonna go from that realization to a massive global uh, vaccine or, development, or drug development campaign? And then how do we equitably distribute those products to populations in need, to countries in need. You know, you, sometimes crises create opportunities. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to be Pollyannish about this terrible situation we're in, but, but sometimes the facts force action. And, and so that may, be our, our, that may be an opportunity that could come out of this. Sabina, I don't know if you... I think John gave a very good answer. Uh, I don't have much to add to it. I'm, I'm, I'm always hopeful that something, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think John gave a very comprehensive answer, to be honest. I think it's a complicated space, and I hope that countries and communities can come together, given what, what's happening now to the world currently. Yeah. yeah. That, thanks to both of you. Uh, Montrese, this is, question is for you, from in Tony. And um, he, he mentions that nations are struggling with harm reduction and initiatives that deal with behaviors that are considered illegal. And other nations seem to have an easier time dealing with these initiatives. Can you talk, talk a little bit about how to manage harm reduction initiatives through an international legal lens? Um, I don't know much about international law. So I would probably tip that one over to John and Sabina. Um, but I think that one of the things that in the public health law program we've sort of identified with is, is this idea that um, using law to address the social determinants of health um, provide a, a opportunity for us to make changes in the environment in the community that are, um, make it very difficult for people not to benefit from them despite individual behavior and individual action. So to focus on um, making changes that we know will improve health um, that address the social determinants. I don't know if that helps at all, but from an yeah. international standpoint, I'll share with my partner, John. I might just supplement. I think Matrice really hit it right on the head. I, I would just say that uh, the, embedded in Tony's question, which is an excellent one, is the challenge, is, is that all the challenges Matrice described domestically about uh, bringing harm reduction into our public health dialogue and the public health law. There's an internet, there is a quite extensive and lengthy international regime that reinforces the idea that countries should uh, have strict uh, controls uh, of uh, 
its international drug control regime broadly stated, especially around illicit drugs. And so it begs the question of whether are those international regimes that were, to, that were established to help countries, quote, fight drugs, uh, fight drugs and fight the dr drug trade, which I don't think anybody supports the illicit drug trade, but those international instruments may actually make it harder for countries to move to more thoughtful public health driven evidence-based um, harm reduction initiatives and so I, I think unfortunately international the international many international instruments here may be may retard innovation rather than promote it by the same token there's also an opportunity from the if you look at that think of the way i laid out the sort of global ecosystem there is an opportunity for countries to learn on a horizontal basis from experience and clearly other countries, I think Portugal in particular, but many others operate different regimes here. And presumably we could learn quite a bit from that to inform the kinds of conversations that Mentrice and her colleagues are dealing with every day. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Montrice and John. And John, thanks for bringing up the Portuguese example where we know they were faced with a catastrophic opioid outbreak, but introduced harm reduction strategies that really massively reduced the mortality from overdoses. Uh, Montrese, this before we go into the last comments, Montrese, this question is for you, and we're going to we'll go in reverse. Uh, Dean Rashid, you'll go first, um, Ms. Ransom second, and then Professor Monahan third. Um, Montrese, this question uh, is for you, um, and you gave a really powerful quote about public health law at its best is use a scientific insight and legal might. Fantastic quote. So can you share with the audience how we can do a better job of bridging the gap between the legal and health communities. I mean, this sort of presentation is, is an example. Um, throughout of my career, I've really tried to make law a little less scary for public health practitioners and to really get folks um, to understand that there is no public health in the United States without the law. From the establishment of a health department, which is done by statute, to the passing of a clean indoor air ordinance, or using regulatory powers to create a prescription drug monitoring program, there is no public health in the United States without the law. And so my mission really has been to convince people of that and to really get um, practitioners to understand um, why federalism is important. And why understanding federalism and police powers and some of those basic principles um, are practically important to them doing their job every day. Um, and that they have some power and some authority in that on a state and local level, because public health is not uh, mentioned as an enumerated power for the federal government. We get in it in a wide variety of ways, but it's not one of our enumerated powers. So, I think one of the best ways, um, and again, it's my bias from where I sit, but it's, it's education. It's really trying to integrate, um, better integrate law into schools and programs of public health and to not necessarily create more public health lawyers, but to create more public health practitioners that are savvy in understanding when law can be used as a tool, how we can use our legal system to ensure um, that, that, that we are taking the right steps to improve health outcomes um, by using the legal system. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ransom. And so last um, uh, comment before we close, um, uh, if you have any final uh, words or thoughts, uh, Dean Rashid, over to you, then Ms. Ransom, and then Professor Monahan. Uh, Dean Rashid, over to you. Um, just, just to wrap up, um, I think as we look at public health education, I think the critical thing is to inculcate within students um, the qualities of empathy and social justice uh, uh, and to try and understand and, and, and think about community-centered perspectives in, in, in their education, but also as they move on uh, to work in the public health field or other fields. I think it's very, very critically important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Montrese? Um, I'll just, just reiterate my um, sort of point that I made earlier today that um, I'm honored to be here on this particular panel and to learn about what's happening globally and internationally because I am um, very, very convinced that 
law is the most significant determinant of health in this country. Um, and we need to start looking at the determinants of health through that lens um, if we want to make changes. Thank you. Thank you, Montrese. Uh, John? I would just close with uh, the one of the commission's recommendations and one of the determinants we enumerate is about the critical need for lawyers and health professionals, both practitioners and students, I think to be in a dialogue together about the power of law to do exactly what Montrese and the Dean articulated. And I would close just with a, a, a plea to not narrow our lens to only the laws that say health in them. The, some of the most important legal uh, determinants of health are going to be beyond things that say health. It'll be other playing in other sandboxes, tax policy, uh, income supports, minimum wage laws, housing, ec nutrition. There's a whole range of legal spheres where if we bring the health measure to bear, we can make a huge effect. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Monahan, and for those closing point. It's, it's about well-being, not just about the big age health. So I would like to thank all of our wonderful uh, panelists today for sharing their expertise and for all of you for your thoughtful questions. A recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the ASPPH website. Additionally, ASPPH has compiled resources and guidance from member schools and programs of public health as they respond to the COVID-19 pandemic locally and globally. And as we close out the session, we'd really appreciate it if you could take a moment to complete a very brief session survey. It'll help ASPPH uh, in terms of what, uh, um, what it does in the future in terms of these, uh, these uh, sessions. Uh, Zoom will display it right on your web browser. And please also um, take a look at the upcoming virtual annual meeting sessions that, that Dorothy mentioned at the outset. You can learn more about ASPPH on its website. And I'd like to, just to conclude to thank you all for joining and I wish you all have a wonderful day. Bye-bye for thank now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody, have a great one. Hey, yeah, take thank care you. of everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much everybody, did a great job. Take care. Keep thank, thank you. you. Thank you.